Okay, welcome back. Um, I don't know, I guess I don't really have any administrative, any things um, that have come up during the break. Um, I'm gonna keep going. Um, okay, so now that we have more about character sets and encoding than you possibly wanted to know, but you did need to know, let's go back to HTTP itself. Um, mention these um, redirect codes, the, the 300, well, the 300 series that are really redirects and the 410 gone. Um, that are again generically for things that have been moved or removed, um, and like I did, like I did this example before, um, and we saw this location header come up when I made the request. This is I dealt with automatically by the browser, right? So again, it's the the user should never see, and as much as the the server does send some little stub of a page like this that is, hey, you know, this is been redirected or there, there is a redirect here to something else um, like this one did um, the user never the user never sees this page um, the user is uh, like finds himself automatically at that URL which probably is, is good behavior right they don't need to see this um, to the point, by the way, that like if you're like when you're developing, a lot of even developer tools will automatically follow that redirect, and you have to like convince them not to. Um, so how do you as a as a developer produce this? Um, well, you can do it at the web server level. Like Nginx has this rewrite, I don't know, directive or whatever it's called, um, where you can just say things like. All of these go to there, right? So I guess their examples here are anything that's download, like I guess it's a regular expression, like slash download slash something slash media slash eh, gets turned into, I assume this is a capture group. So like download slash whatever slash mp3 slash something dot mp3. Um, so you can say this, and it's often, again, a little bit of, like, it does feel like a little bit like you're casting a magic spell here, but again, some description of when URLs that look like this come in, redirect to URLs that look like that with a 403, oh no, I guess it's, the, the redirect is implicitly uh, temporary, and then if you come through, there's the, the 403 forbidden, I guess, is what's being said there. But this is a really common thing to do, right? So say, well, look, listen on port 80. If any request comes in on port 80, redirect them over to the HTTPS version of the site. Or, you know, everything in this directory has moved to that directory. Or there's some static content where I, as a developer, just I have no way to involve myself in the process other than let the, the thing that's serving the static content deal with it. So you know, the, the style sheet had to move or something like that. Um, again, on the dynamic side of things where you're actually in control as a developer, um, your tools will help you probably. Um, so one of the things you can do like in Django, you can, well, you are creating HTTP responses in views. That's just the game that's being played. Um, you can produce an HTTP, HTTP response redirect and you can do it from this kind of convenient helper function that will let you get there. Um, or produce a similar thing over there. Again, I, I just want a redirect and I bet there's some parameter there that's like, oh yeah, permanent equals false or permanent equals true for do you want the 40, uh, the 30, what is it, 1 or 302? Um, Great, easy. Um, so of course, as soon as you you open this up to, you know, the developer as opposed to the server administrator, um, all of a sudden, you know, just whatever you want to, I guess, express in your programming language is on the table. Um, so like this example is something like, well, if we're getting a post request, right? So we have a form submission, we do the thing, like we we, I guess, do the side effect. And then redirect the user to view that new object is, I guess, what I'm implying here, right? So we created an object based on some kind of logic, and then 
I guess that object has a URL that it knows about itself, and I'll, I'll redirect the user to see it. Again, is what I guess I'm imagining that code is all about. It's one of these. Um, this is something that, again, I think this takes a little bit of planning that you probably don't want to delete records from your database. Um, partially because un undelete is a really useful feature to have, and partially because if you have some some logic that's like, okay, well, when this you know, URL like this comes in, look up by this key in the database and find the object and display it. If you delete an object, you're going to you kind of have no choice but to produce a 404 in that in its place because you don't know there used to be an object there. So you kind of don't want to delete the row. You want to have a like is deleted equals true or is deleted equals false column in your table. And then you have some kind of like if you know is deleted return a 410 gone, else display the object. Or if it's been deleted, maybe it's been deleted with a flag of like here's the product in our product catalog that replaces it or something like that. Um, sometimes you, you end up in this case where just like we, we thought we had a good URL structure and we didn't. Uh, we did not plan far enough ahead for how our data was going to be organized. So we had to take the old sort of URL and redirect to the new kind of URL. Sometimes that's easier to do in code. And I think you should. Um, like, I, I say this and developers don't do it. I do my best to do it. Um, if a URL was visible yesterday, it should be visible today, or it should be usable today. May, again, maybe the data gets deleted and it has to be a 410 gone, but it should be a 410 gone. It shouldn't be a 404 not found. No working URL should ever become a 404 not found. Um, and again, this is why, uh, again, it, it sort of comes into your data design uh, on your application that, well, what do I mean by delete? Is it full, if it really is truly fully delete, maybe what you need is a separate table of like deleted like row markers or something like I, I would look up the product by this product number because that's what's in the URL. But I also have a separate thing of like deleted products that will, if I find something in the table for that, it will be a 410 gone. Um, but you need the data to back that up. Um, this it's the one link I don't have to check before I give a lecture because I'm confident this URL will work next semester. Um, it's this essay from Tim Berners-Lee, who is the, the creator of the web. And it's basically, yeah, you don't, first of all, if possible, don't change your URLs, period. And if you have to change them, leave a redirect. And there's, he gives a couple examples here, just things like, um, where are his examples? It's something like, oh yeah, like, you know, I had this bookmarked URL and they just stopped updating that URL. They started updating some completely different URL, but the old one was still there with out of date information. Or this, which was the help link, like in Microsoft, whatever, you know, going to the thing help took you to a URL that just didn't exist anymore and was hard coded in the software. Both of those are unacceptable. Um, so, of course, it takes a little bit of design and it's something you'd, you'd need to do at the start of a project. Just what are our URLs going to look like? How, and that takes a little bit of foresight of like, how is the product going to evolve? What kinds of things are we going to need in the future? We have to make sure we kind of leave space for them. <clears throat> um, and again, it's not easy to do. Like there's definitely places where I have really struggled with this one. Um, in code, oh, it's just like, oh crap, crap, I need to, again, I I have deleted objects. I've deleted data because, uh, you know, somebody, some user clicked on the delete button. Now what do I do? Um, and had to sort of refactor code to, to make the right thing happen, which was some kind of 410 gone or redirect to the, the index or something like that. But again, planning ahead helps, like just decent software engineering helps. Okay, um, 
there were some HTTP headers that went by back there that I kind of ignored uh, both this week and last week. And it turns out we have a lot more information about the user uh, when a request comes in than, again, most web developers really know about or make use of. Um, we can do this content negotiation. Um, so we had, okay, I guess this is a request I had in my slide. No, this is a different request than the one I had in my slides. Um, but it's a reasonable request that we can make. It turns out web browsers are sending these three headers. And again, if I bring up the developer tools, uh, if I reload this page, they were being sent. Um, okay, wait. Let's not show you another cookie. Um, there we go. Um, so yeah, these re request headers have been sent, like my browser sent these three headers that are pretty similar to the ones on the slide here um, when it requested that file. What are they for? Um, so I guess maybe the first thing is just how to read this. It is pretty dense. So there's all of these things are, they're all a comma separated list even though they're semicolons here, like this is one element in the list. So commas are the separation that you sort of look at first. <clears throat> and there's an implicit quality that is decreasing from one down. So this is quality one, this is quality one, this is quality 0.9, this is quality 0.8. So on a scale of zero to one, how good is this thing? Um, it's hard to again. It's hard to parse because I think in English you don't you don't want the semicolon to bind more tightly than the comma or whatever. But so again, quality one, quality point nine, quality point nine because the quality has to be non increasing, and then quality point one for and the star is at an anything. That's how you read that. Okay, here's what these headers are actually doing. Um, the accept header is what types, like what file types, what media types, um, the browser is sort of uh, likes, likes is maybe the right word. Um, what are the highest quality things? So, and what I got here um, is pretty similar. Um, hey, I'm just requesting some page. I like HTML, I like XHTML, uh, I like other XML a little bit less. I like WebP images or you know whatever other file type you've got so again the star is a is a glob so it's sort of anything is what's being said there um that's good i guess um where this i think really comes into play is for all the other requests that are coming coming down the line here especially something like an image so like i mean there there is an image on that page uh where to go there so when the Oh, there we are. Um, so this is Firefox. So when Firefox sees an image, you know, source equals in HTML, it knows it's requesting an image. It changes the accept header to say, I like WebP or, or anything else. So it kind of implicitly, WebP images are a little better than others. Chrome is much more verbose there. I had to look up what ABIF is. It's a new image format that apparently is supported in Chrome now. Uh, WebP or APNG or uh, SVG images or any other image or anything else. Again, if you want to send me a PDF to put in this spot, I guess, sure. But um, this information is being sent to the server and the server can make a choice. The server can say, I can produce this image, uh, like the one I'm looking at, it's just a little Creative Commons deal down here. Maybe the server can produce a WebP version of this image or a PNG version of this image. Now it can look at this header and decide, this browser likes WebP images. Maybe some other web browser comes along and it prefers PNG images and send the right thing in the right context. Um, again, so this that's the Firefox like font header for something where it's going to request a font. I thought there would be one here. Those are all JavaScript. Um, oh, what does it say? Like when you're requesting a JavaScript. So this is a script, yeah, script source. Uh, it just says, yeah, whatever. Like, I, I guess it, it, it could say I like JavaScript here, but it doesn't. Um, so this is where the sort of content, the negotiation of content negotiation that's in the header here is, well, now there's this implicit 
like, hey, I would like data in these kinds of formats. And I think images are the most obvious one where it's like, should I send the WebP or should I send the JPEG or the PNG or whatever? Um, modern browsers all announced that they know how to deal with WebP images, which is cool because they do. And that it's a more compact image format, you know, less, less bytes for the same content, which is great. Faster transfer. Um, the other headers that were there, um, except language is something about a person, which means it's kind of, it can be sketchy. Um, like if I, and again, they, they seem to rearrange, like Firefox rearranges its, its settings window approximately once per time, per every time I give this course. So let's see if I can find it. Um, no, it's general somewhere here. There's that language. Okay. Okay, so this is probably a result of the last time I taught this course that I bet um, can, I can't, oh, so probably English US is my system language. I can't remove it. So probably this is what it looked like when I kind of first logged into this account. But, and again, like there's going to be people in this class right now, like who have like their OS default is, is Chinese or French or something but they can also read English just fine. The reason this header is sketchy is because nobody bothers, right? Most users don't think, oh, wait, I also can read German. They don't go to this dialogue box and put that in there. Um, if they did, uh, like this Debian page, I think, I didn't actually check this one, but so it was in English. Ooh, I did not. So it used to be if I reloaded that page, I would magically get the my preferred language version of it. Um, Oh crap, my my UI. Oh wait, no. I think it, sorry, it just said there I have to uh I think it said I had to except it said it in German. I said you have to restart the browser for this to take effect, so I'm not going to do that. Um yeah, I, I will invite you to experiment on your own and let's okay, wait, let's restart Firefox. There. Okay, fine. Let's let's hope I don't suddenly get German web pages next time I record a lecture. Um, but yeah, so again, this is this user understands English and, and French at a sort of lower quality or lower level of understanding, I guess. Um, so you can automatically deliver a user the content that they can they can actually read and they don't have to go to a separate URL. Um, but because it is about people, you kind of have to, right? So even on this site, like, okay, you, you still can opt and say, well, I do really want the Dutch Netherlands version, I guess, of the page. Um, and that does change the URL because uh, the user has to be able to override this one. Um, because again, it's often set wrong because people speak more than one language, but haven't told their web browser. Um, in your tools, um, again, like this, it's internationalization and localization is often handled, or at least somehow, like you can be helped along by your frameworks where you can say like, um, like this is one of these irritating things that's like conceptually very easy um, and in practice very hard. All right, so this is send the user their version of hello world. Uh, so this is in a, a Ruby uh, ERB template. Um, give them the appropriate translation for themselves, for them. So all you have to do is sort of say every possible place where a, a user visible string occurs, trans, like put it in a translation file, which I was hoping there would be an example of here somewhere. Um, but um, yeah, just, yeah, this, right? So every possible language or every language that you want to do, every possible string that the user sees anywhere, put it in the translation file. It's very easy to say, um, very um, resource intensive to actually do. Um, yeah, like maybe I should reword this. It's easy. It's conceptually very easy to do it. It's just a lot of work. Um, can be done. And it can be done very easily and all, again, almost transparently for the users because of that. Um, okay, the third header that was in there is this. Okay, so again, my browser, when I was doing those demos before, was just saying English because that's what I had set. The accept encoding header is about 
really compression. Um, it's it, the, the way that things are encoded in this context is by running them through some compression algorithm. So what this means is, like this is why if a server wants to, it can send a gzip encoded version of that. So HTML pre compresses pretty well. Style sheets compress pretty well. Um, PDF documents compress well. Run them through some compression algorithm, send that over the wire, and then the, the browser knows how to uncompress is what's being promised here. Well, that's great. That, that would be really nice to be able to do. Um, and again, I suspect if I have a look here, um, I will see. So wait, request request headers. I said, and then do I not have? Oh, so there is no. So what what I would expect to see there is an encoding header on the on the way back that says, "Hey, this is encoded as as gzip content." Um, maybe it's just not being shown in the developer tools. Um, because I do suspect that if I do this, um, like, so if I do a curl request for that, I think it will be gzip encoded if I request it. Yeah. So again, what I just did there, this, cur this curl switch is add this uh, request header. So I added the accept encoding header and said, I'm comfortable with gzip. And then when the server chose to send that thing back, it decided, oh, I think I was looking for encoding, not content encoding. Uh, it said, hey, this is gzip for you. Um, and again, with a promise that the browser, user agent, whatever, knows how to un-gzip that stuff back into the actual HTML. Um, that's great. So again, I suspect what's going on there that because I know that static content, the server is just configured that CSS and HTML and things, those are compressible, compress them probably if they're over some, you know, some little threshold of, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to bother compressing a one kilobyte file probably, but, um, yeah, so something like that. So if it's these types and it's greater than that size, compress it. Um, for dynamic content, it's probably less worth it. Um, you're probably not generating huge responses. They're probably different for every user. Um, for static content, maybe the server will compress it once and just kind of keep its cache copy of the compressed version of that file. Um, yeah, okay. So be cautious with it, I guess. But um, there is something like... Um, Really? Um, oh, sorry. I didn't want cache page. Sorry, that's, I want a gzip page. Um, there's a decorator um, that you can just put on there. And, like you can just say like this view, uh, you can gzip what comes out of it. It might be worth it. Um, so maybe there's something there. Maybe you can configure your server to do it. But it's worth it, and it's worth it for static content. And if I come back to where my dev tool's gone, um, like this page, if I like hard reload it, so that's Control Shift R to reload everything. Um, yeah. So the thing that's being said down here is it. It's a total of seven hundred thirteen kilobytes of stuff but only 247 kilobytes got transferred and that's because compression helped. And again, you can see over here, like this was 31 kilobytes of HTML. It got compressed. So only 10 kilobytes were necessary to transfer over the, over the network. And that's great. And so, yeah, things, oh, right. So this CSS compressed really, really well um, as most CSS would and JavaScript would text is kind of repetitive so it compresses well um that, what, oh and i guess you sorry i'm since i'm looking at it here here a little bit more was transferred so i think that's just http headers so the file is this big that plus the headers it probably wasn't compressed were just a little bit bigger okay um but again usually here it's things are much much smaller because they're being well compressed 
and that's great. I don't want to I don't want to pay to transfer any more bytes than absolutely necessary. And again, I know that those exist because my uh, I, I know I know the protocol. Like the protocol kind of reveals all of these things that it can do if you know to go looking. So next thing I want to talk about here, uh, and I'll spend the rest of tonight talking about today, this afternoon, whenever this lecture actually is, this morning as I record. Um, <clears throat> again, I, I think this has been a bit of a running theme already. Um, I want my site to be fast, right? So when a user clicks on a thing, I want that to be res to get there quickly. I want them to look be looking at a page that's ready to read as quickly as possible. Um, there's a lot of things to be said there. There's a lot of like what frankly I'm going to call superstition on the part of web developers. That's like, oh, if you do this, it's faster. And you know, in every case I can think of, yes, sometimes. Sometimes the thing that people have as a, a sort of um performance superstition sometimes will help and sometimes won't. And I, I I want to talk a little bit more about details here because it's just you will find so many things in so many places that are just like sort of cargo cult thinking of like you everybody has to do this because that's how pages get to be fast. Um, there's there's more to think about. Um, here's for me what I like what I think about when I'm looking at a web page and I want it to be fast. First thing is just how much do I have to transfer. If, if that, I mean, what did I, what did I say there? Like when I reloaded that page, okay, I mean, this is a different page. It'll be a little different, but it was, yeah, under a megabyte. That's pretty, pretty snug by modern standards. If I come over to here, if I reload this page, um, no, nope, that's the same page. How do I, I guess I have to open tool. Okay. If I reload this page, to do still loading still loading it's so again much less savings by compression because probably a lot of what's on here are images that are pre-compressed like gzipping them isn't helping um so this is i already forgot how big my page whoops still loading um this is several times larger um <clears throat> was it 12 times or so again i wasn't i wasn't paying attention i forget what the number was but more bytes are going to take more time to transfer and all the tricks that you play on all the other things we're going to talk about, um, size of the files is probably going to dominate. Okay, once you have a reasonably small page, you want to get them to the user quickly, right? You want your web server to, to send them quickly. You want the network to be quick in between you and them, right? All of that stuff. Um, and then, okay. Number of HTTP requests. And again, this is something that I find developers spend a lot of time worrying about because it's under their control. The, the developer has directly decided like how many link style sheet things will there be? How many script elements will there be, right? Each one of these implies a separate request. Um, sorry, I was just, those. oh no, sorry, wrong site. Yes, that, that is what I expect to see. Um, <clears throat> okay, so more HTTP requests. And again, this thing that we saw, um, wherever that was, where there were these paid, these things that did not get compressed. Here's one, I suspect. Um, yeah, so every HTTP request, a request has to get sent, a few bytes to do that. A response has to come back. There's headers and stuff, a few bytes for that. So yeah, there's a, you know, half a kilobyte or something expense to every request. And oh, I guess there's, sorry, this is probably only measuring the response, not the request itself. So a few more for the response. And, you know, something like this. This is a 243 byte long style sheet. I spent five times more just sending the, the response headers and stuff back to get it. That's an expensive way to get 243 bytes. Yeah, I, I would like less requests if I can. And then there's a page drawing thing, right? So just because of the, well, whether or not the browser has the bytes, there's the question of what will, what can the browser draw on the screen? So, you know, for something like this image, that's a few slides along here, 
the browser could have put these words on the screen before it loaded that image. And I, you know, I can't quite tell what happened here because all these other things are, are in pretty good shape on that page. So whether or not it drew the, you know, it drew, it drew these characters on the screen before it downloaded that image, I don't know. Uh, I can't tell, but I guess it could have. That would have been good. Okay. So again, starting the story here, again, a little bit of like sort of more to less important in my mind with no, maybe that's not a really strict order, but caching. And again, you can, you can control caching as a web developer and you should more than a lot of web developers think about it. Um, <clears throat> so web browsers cache content, right? And there is, again, where is it? somewhere in the settings, right? I guess it's kind of a privacy thing because it's in there, but so my stuff, including the cache, are currently pretty small. I feel like I might have I might have flushed that at some point recently in this account. That seems like a relatively small amount. Yeah, best part of a gigabyte? I don't know. Anyway, <clears throat> so the idea here is this content, okay, again, whatever it is here, um, so again, I just hit Control Shift R, and which is ignore the cache, right? So the browser hit this page and completely ignored its cache. It had to transfer everything. Or again, if I was a brand new user that has never been on this site before, never been on the internet before, whatever, would have had to transfer all these things. But if I have that, if I click on, well, okay, if I get tools up here for that page, that tab. And I click that link. Okay, well, everything was cached because I just clicked that link three minutes ago when I was talking about something else. And all of these JavaScript, all the SVG, everything, nothing had to be transferred over the network. That was cool. That's way faster and probably part of the reason I'm seeing that thing um, appear really fast on screen because actually when I clicked that link, there was no network traffic necessary to get there. So we want to get kind of as close to that as possible um, because, well, my disk is faster than my network, and that's going to be true for pretty much everybody. Certainly the network when we're talking about like the internet, um, not just the, the network in the building. So one, one thing that can happen here that's not common, but it, it's technically possible and worth mentioning, is this shared proxy cache. So this is like if you have gone in your th thing or like it's part of your more likely, I guess, part of your like um, corporate network policy that's pushed out by the, the sysadmins. Um, so, you know, you can say like all HTTP traffic, don't send directly to the server. So when you ask for ggbaker.ca, don't go directly to the server. Go to this proxy cache, ask them for it. Um, and I'm not convinced those are correct. I seem to remember this demo failing last time I did it. Um, oh, no, that is right. Okay. So what just happened was my web browser connected proxy.lib.sfu.ca on port 8080 and said, hey, hey, you're a proxy server. Can you send me, like, I want to request this page. The reason to do that and the reason that, like, again, it might be sort of part of corporate, you know, image for your your desktop or whatever is if we can have one cache that we all share less traffic has to transfer to the outside world and probably this is where well this is probably the bottleneck and it's probably where the money is spent like probably you know money is spent for the number of bytes that transfer this wire to the outside world um we want to do as little as possible here and doing stuff in here is much cheaper and much faster so possible, can be done, um, less common, but again, having a shared cache among a bunch of users, even better as long as everything goes well. Um, but probably what you have is just the, the cache in your web browser, right? So this piece of software right here is storing some stuff on disk. And you know, when I went to that page, <clears throat> this, whatever this is, um, um, the JavaScript for for um, MathJax, 
coming from Cloudflare was already cached because, well, probably I've had to load it before. I've already seen that URL, so great. <clears throat> so here's how that works. Um, let's say, so again, let's let's say this was you know this web page back here that was cached. So I, originally, like the first time I came along, I got this 200 OK and a bunch of information about when it was last modified and oh the expires header. So this is saying, okay, the, so the thing was last modified at 1 p.m. on whatever day, but you can cache it until 7 p.m. on that same day, like according to this header. You don't even have to ask me. So again, I on the server side as a developer or a sysadmin, I have control over that. I can put whatever expires header makes sense for this content. And I can say this, and I'll come back to this in a little bit, but this is, I have a, if you have a cached copy and another user comes along, again, maybe it is a shared cache, the other user has a different accept language header, the cache doesn't count. So it's basically, if any of these request headers are different, don't, don't look at the cache. So the cache is somehow, like this is part of the key, I guess, in that lookup. Um, but maybe it's before, like, maybe we have a cached copy, like we have this thing that was last modified, September 1st, whatever. It's after the expiry time. Well, the the user agent, the browser, can still use that information. So it can still make the request and say, you know what, um, I have this thing. Like, I have a cached copy that you told me was last modified, September 1st, whatever. If I can use that, let me know. So that again is part of the request. Um, and if I, if I on this page, I open up this. If I reload here, um, oh right, I I have the I have the uh, sorry, I'm still within the like expires header time. Um, I don't know if I can force it. Like I don't think there's a key I can press to to force at just that level. Um, like I guess we could wait a few hours or whatever, and if I reloaded, um, I would see what happens then. Um, but again, the the things that might happen, I guess, in order of preference, um, hopefully, my cached copy is current. Like that's what I've been seeing over here um, as I've been like navigating around is just everything is cached um no don't even touch the network that's going to be extremely fast and that's great or again if we wait a few hours on that and i i click through to that page again and so this is the case where i have a cached copy but it's like after the expiry time so the browser has to check. It has to say, okay, look, you told me I have to check after the, this expiry time. What do you think? Um, so the server can come back and say, oh yeah, the one you have is fine. Like we, we weren't sure when that file was going to change, but it has not changed since you last um, saw it. So just use, the, use your cached copy. So we still had to have a little network traffic. The request and this response still had to come back but we didn't actually have to send the entire HTML page or the entire JPEG image or whatever it is. So that's still really good. We've still saved a lot of, of um, network traffic there. Or maybe it has changed, right? Totally possible that file has changed or the some, some piece of code that gen generates dynamic content um, sort of checks to see, oh yes, I am going to send you different content than I would have a few hours ago, so, so 200 okay, and send the whole file. So in this case, like in this story, the 200 okay is like the worst possible case uh, if there's a cache in the way. It's like, oh, we actually had to send all those bytes over the network. Ugh. Um, <clears throat> like I said, there's a couple of other headers that control how caches get um used and checked and again this is for the like this case right where there's one cache and a lot of users behind it um 
again, like my browser can deal with broadly and broadly compressed content. Maybe yours can't. So if we have a different accept encoding, well, we'll have to generate a new response for that user. Or this page is translated. We have English and French and whatever versions of this page. So if a user comes along, like if the same user comes along and they have the, the same accept encoding and accept language or another user comes along with the exact same settings on those two headers, fine, we can use a cache. I, that's what I use as input into deciding what to give the user. Great. Um, but different value there. We, we'll have to check. We'll have to regenerate. Um, and again, we're going to distinguish here for static versus dynamic content. <clears throat> static content, again, files on a disk, way easier to, to sort of reason about because files on a disk have a last modified time. So, oh, wow, this has got more addy. Um, but yeah, so in Nginx, for example, you can just say things like, okay, like within this directory or whatever is being said here, any images or style sheets or JavaScript, I suppose, is again, what, what we're expressing here expires a year in the future. That's a pretty aggressive expiry time, but you could say, right? We have, yeah, we have all these images. They're fine. Like we're not going to change the the corporate logo. I think you might be shocked how often those things that you think never change will change. I, I would be hard pressed to say 365 days, but hey, give it a day, probably fine. Um, and you can see this. Um, Hmm, I don't know if I can um, oh wait, I'm making you do this on, I don't I don't need to do it here. I'm making you do it on exercise three, so I don't need to do it. Um, but yeah, you can make the request with the if modified sense header and see the 304 come back. Um, the oh I didn't I did not mention e tags. So the uh, um, response header that's coming back here, yeah, <clears throat> comes with this e tag header, and this is, um, it's some kind of unique identifier for this specific piece of content. Um, I, you know, I don't know where it came from, but the promise is, if if the author, if you know, if I go and I change that file on disk, this string will change. Um, that's, you know, it might be, a, it might be a hash of the content. It might be something else. Um, so, and where is it here? Um, sorry, there. So for, again, for a request, a request, where's my, oh, there we go for request. Um, the browser can send these e tags and basically say like i have these versions like i have the content that you called 3e307 i have this content that you called 53cde for this url if one of those i can use one of those and again the even if there's like a whole bunch of different versions of that file again for different languages for different accept headers whatever um the server can come back and say yep not modified use this one this user should get this version of the file. Uh, and so you can kind of do that selection um, as part of the, the HTTP conversation. Um, sorry, uh, where were we there? Yeah. <clears throat> um, for dynamic content, it's more complicated as it always is because like for static content, the server knows what to do. It knows about files and last modified times for dynamic content well it's calling effectively it's calling a function that you wrote or a method or whatever how does it know like is this function going to return the same content now that it did five minutes ago for a different user maybe um so there's no there's no safe guess to make so for any dynamic content the default is going to be basically no caching is happening but well again you're you're a programmer now um, or you get to program in this story, so you can do it. You can set an expires header. It's pretty easy. It's going to be, you know, one line of code, some equivalent of, of, there we go. Um, uh, 
I don't know. Like, wh however, you know, whatever string you have to produce in that spot. Um, okay, you, you can do it. And again, any framework, like whatever framework you're using, will have some version of that. If you do want to add a header, you can do it. Um, you could see a request come in and see um, if modified sense or etag header um, and say, oh yeah, use that one. Use that etag, it's great. Um, and frankly, I don't usually bother. Um, in dynamic content, it can be done. It can be done safely. It can be done well. It can really speed things up. Is it worth it? Well, maybe. Maybe not. Uh, frankly, I, I would do it if I had content that I knew was going to change infrequently, or if I had some idea when it was going to change. Like this content only changes after the overnight refresh at three in the morning. So expires at four in the morning or whatever, 3.30. Um, so again, you can kind of include that knowledge about the system in and speed everything up. Or uh, maybe if there was if I had content that was really really expensive to generate and again relatively infrequently changing maybe it's worth again like do you have the cached copy because it's going to take me a whole bunch of database queries to recreate it for you okay 304 not found um there is sorry this is the one I my fingers google uh, searched for a few minutes ago uh, by habit this cache page decorator in Django um, so this is a view in Django, a controller in any other framework. Yeah, I, the, the terminology gets used differently. But yeah, so this is cache. This this is something you can cache for 15 minutes. And again, just the semantics of that decorator, uh, decorator in Python, it modifies the function that follows it, um, is it will be cached server side. Um, so it would be cached like within the application logic. Uh, it will use memcache or Redis to cache that content. So basically, I guess basically what I've said here is this function will only ever get called once every 15 minutes. It will get called, cached. 15 minutes later, the cache expires on the server side and it will get called again. And then on the client side, again, there's an expires header that gets sent. It, it you know deals with all of that. So the any individual client won't make a request, we hope, for the next 15 minutes either. Um, so again, caching matters. Like I, I, again, I see so many developers kind of just ignoring its existence. Um, you know, for something like um, course web page, um, uh, I don't know this this doesn't change very often again some some sense of how often it changes um <clears throat> now here's something different right so this at least this string varies um and it varies on who is logged in so as soon as i need and it's the cookie header that that's going to tell me who is logged in so i have to have very cookie on that, and I'm willing to bet. Um, again, let's not let's not show any cookies there, but um, yeah. So that that response came back with very cookie. So if I like this current session that that represents me, if I go back to that page, maybe there's some caching that can be done. But if you go with your login session the cache is not relevant. So this is part of the reason like for dynamic content, are you going to worry about caching? Well, probably you're going to be sending different content to every user. So there's relatively little to be gained by 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 doing all of this stuff, at least at the HTTP level. Um, ugh. Um, one thing that can be done, you know, I didn't point out back here, you can still do caching in your code, um, where is it here? Low cache API. So the I thought they had a better example. Um, again, as a developer, um, most frameworks have some version of this, or you can just use Redis or Memcached, um, some piece of technology that is basically a really fast key value store, um, and you can set and say like, look, I have a content named my key. 
it's this. Cache it for 30 seconds. So you might have something like that that's again kind of expensive to generate, um, but it doesn't change too often. So again, something like this page, um, all of the, the sort of main content in the page is generated from Markdown. Probably Markdown has to get converted to HTML. That's a little bit expensive. Like that is cached. The the what what's the HTML associated with this page um, gets cached by Courses using something like this. Like set the page contents for this page to this string of HTML. Um, and if the user edits edits it, you have to invalidate that cache. But it can be um, good savings. Um, okay, what was I here? Um, <clears throat> so again, my experience is that web developer, like backend web developers, think too much about code, not enough about everything else that's on the page. Um, again, a page like this um, is what was it? It's well, six megabytes all in um, before compression. Only 42 and some and a bit kilobytes of that are HTML. So maybe this page is the HTML itself is generated dynamically. Maybe we have to regenerate that every time because it's too hard to cache it. But this jQuery file and this whatever.js and this uh, PNG image, those can be compressed and are by far the majority of, of bytes that have to get transferred for this page. Um, don't forget about that. Um, you're also probably going to share it across different pages. Um, again, uh, so something like this, if we have a look at the page source, uh, well, okay, let's not get into that yet. Let's do this one. Okay, this site slash style.css. I'm willing to bet that, you know, if I click this page or this page, they use that same style sheet. So on the second one, it's cached. And that's great. And it's probably cached with an expiry time. That's great. It's a very fast to pull something out of the cache, much faster than transferring it over the network. Um, for, yeah, let's go this order. Um, this is part of the reason, like I, I think I said a few weeks ago, but like, don't do this. Don't have, don't have CSS or JavaScript in line like this. So you can do it. You can have style sheets in HTML in your HTML template. You can have um, JavaScript code in your HTML template, don't do it. And the reason is this has to get delivered. It has to get, you know, handled by Ruby on Rails or Express or whatever. It has to get delivered because you can't cache part of a page. You have to catch cache an entire URL. External style sheets, external JavaScript actually can be cached, right? So even though this page and this page are different pages, they're using the same style sheet. It doesn't have to get delivered separately on every request. That's great. Um, even better if the URL that you're referring to is not like it is already in the user's cache when they first come to your site for the first time. Um, and did I see some here? Um, there was some, oh God, some various various like tracking bugs and crap but um here yeah so this like um cdn js cloudflare whatever this font awesome style sheet you probably already had that in your browser cache um so these content delivery networks um cloudflare the the google one uh, both of which are serving like javascript and css files for sort of common client-side libraries um, they're already going to be out there. And so, you know, there's some URL or some, you know, this whatever view.cjs.js, um, that is, well, let's see how it comes. Um, well, it comes back and I guess I'll point out here, right? The version number is in the URL. So I'm pretty confident, and I bet Cloud, or the CDNJS people are pretty confident that this URL is always going to have the same contents forever because if there's new view.js, it'll have a new version. Um, 
So this expires, uh, I guess that's a year or so in the future. I'm recording this on September 20th. So slightly less than a year in the future for whatever reason, but okay. So anybody goes to any page that has that URL on it. Well, I bet a lot of people are using it. Probably that's going to be fast because zero bytes to transfer for your site. Um, the this is again one of one of my annoyances with just like modern um, JavaScript development is just the sheer number of things that end up being sent to the user. Um, it's very easy, and they 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 grow like they grow so quickly that you have like oh I have this JavaScript and I have this JavaScript and I have there might be a footer JavaScript there somewhere. No, I don't. I tend to not do that. I only have two JavaScript chunks. Hmm, okay. Um, I guess there's probably another one on the slide page for the uh, revealed JS. Um, each one of these things, and of course, you're going to have some, again, this happens for style sheets as well, where you have the style sheet for Google Fonts and the style sheet for my slides and the style sheet for Font Awesome icons. And again, they build up. And they're not very good content in terms of network efficiency because this is the kind of javascript code that i write there's a lot of bytes there right there's a lot of like this long variable name that as a programmer of course i should have and as a comment that as a programmer of course i want it to be there but to the compiler this and this are completely equivalent code i think we can all probably agree on that right the compiler doesn't care that this has a meaningful variable name or not. It doesn't care that there's an indentation and a line break. Those are not relevant. So this transform from like this to this is minification. It'd be nice to minify before we send as well. Um, so this is where like asset management tools come into play. And the idea is you take you know, you work with the content you want as a as a developer, and then you say again some version of it. It depends. You know, all the tools are different, but you just say something like, "Okay, look, this is all CSS. Smush this CSS into one resource, like a single file that has to get sent. Minify it, and then sort of rewrite this part of my HTML template with this. And the idea here is that again, this this thing is automatically generated." and the url itself is unique to the content so now if you know if i change my 2.css file the the promise of the tool is that this url will change well this part of the url will change so now i can cache very fearlessly um i can cache basically forever because if there's new content i don't have to worry about the browser having a cached version that's out of date I know I have a chance to send them a, an up-to-date version. Um, and that's happening in Courses. Um, so this is the base template for like every page in Courses or almost every page in Courses. Um, so yeah, like there's a bunch of CSS stuff. There's, you know, SFU style stuff and application stuff. And there's the jQuery UI stuff and a print style sheet and some font awesome stuff. All of these things, well, I guess, again, we don't have to speculate, do we? Um, uh, okay, this tab and this tab. Okay, so right after the title, there's a block of CSS. And right after the title, there's a single CSS link that I bet if I have a look at it, um, is cached for uh, about a year. Um, so, you know, as you're clicking around, you're navigating around courses, every page refers to that style sheet. Um, if a developer changes some of our CSS code that was, you know, in one of these files, the URL will change. So you're not going to have out of date content for the next year. Uh, and I guess you can see here, it, like it also got minified. It got, you know, the, the line breaks and the spaces got knocked away and the comments got knocked out because you don't really need those sent. Uh, in fact, there is some there's some logic there that keeps licensing comments, but not other comments, which is quite clever of it, because probably there's some legal need to send that as an announcement of the license for that content. Anyway, uh, and the same thing is happening on a block of JavaScript there as well. 
And that's great. Um, so again, these are roughly asset management tools or asset pipelines. Um, different frameworks have different ones, um, but yeah, it's worth it. And that's a big speed difference, frankly. Again, the difference between all of these files are sent, where'd it go? Um, all of these files are sent separately sort of as they are on disk versus all of these files are concatenated, minified, and then sent. It's the difference between like two HTTP requests represented by that highlighted code and seven is like 13 HTTP requests for less like larger files because they weren't minified. That's a speed difference I care about. And especially because it's technically easy, like, okay, there's a little bit of like, um, uh, there's a little bit of like setup to be done, but then it just works. Good deal. Um, right. So we have this, uh, unique file name, like con the content determines a unique file name somehow. I don't know how, but it, I don't care. Uh, this is what I care about. If the content changes, the file name changes. So long cache times are cool. Okay. Images. Um, again, we come back to a page like this. Um, Again, developers, uh, like server-side backend web developers, tend to worry a lot about the, the HTML content because that's what they're typically producing, right? Like there's some template, you do a bunch of database queries, you fill content into the template, and you get the 42 kilobyte. Oh, but you know, the developer is also writing script tags. So, okay, we worry about having like, boy, I would like to turn on some asset pipeline for, for these things because look at that. There's one there's, there's I'm not, you know what? I'm not even going to bother counting them. There's a double digit number of JavaScript assets loaded here. For some reason, something called jQuery UI.min.js is loaded twice from two different URLs, but they're very different sizes. That's sketchy as hell. Um, I don't want all these. Like, boy, it would sure, sure be nice. Oh, only those two. Wait, those two weren't, these ones weren't cached? Wait a minute. What's going on here? If I just click a link. Okay. Okay. Go, don't panic. So there, these are at least cached somehow. And again, I bet I can see an expires header here or not. No, I don't get an expires header. Um, hmm, yeah. So there's, there's no expires header on those JavaScript files, which is slowing the world down. Um, Wait, it's six. Oh, it's sixteen bytes. jQuery min.js is not sixteen bytes. I'm not the best front end developer, but I know that much. Uh, maybe there was a redirect there. Um, actually, yeah, maybe those things ended up being redirects. Anyway, um, yeah, there's no expires header on these static assets. That's uh, so there had to be a like request in the three hundred four not modified um, back and forth to get that. All every one of these JavaScript files, what a, what a nightmare that is. Um, and then again, we're going, we're doing all all of whatever else is happening here. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot of requests. Except it's not like in the modern world, that is not a lot of requests. Um, I'm sure if I'd thought about it before class, I could have come up with an example that had many, many more requests just to build one damn web page. Um, you know, I'm pretty happy where, oh God, I have so many consoles here. Um, yeah. Um, you know, this courses page is, okay, that's all of them actually. I can't scroll. I'm, this, I'm, I'm reasonably happy about this, right? So there's an asset managed, it can't be all of them because, what, okay, wait, it's <laughs> wrong thing. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So there's, I, I don't know where my, there is CSS on this page. I have no idea why it's not showing up in the dev tools. Um, let's see the hard reload control shift R. Um, okay. That's more like it. Okay. So there's still, there's 16 requests being made here. That's maybe a larger number than I'm really happy about. Um, some of them are images that kind of have to come separately. There's fonts again that for the SFU of uh, just whatever template that have to be loaded. 
can't do much about those, but I can cache them a long time. And then the actual CSS and JS isn't too bad. J the JavaScript is broken up into a couple of chunks for whatever reason, but I'm not too angry about that. Um, there were, which one's which? Again, this, I just have to stop keeping so many dev tools open. There was 45 requests for the SFU web page, And again, that's not a huge number in the modern world. Um, it should be, but it's not. Um, so the thing that got me onto this <laughs> was um, these the page weight here that, again, developers tend to think about JavaScript and style sheets and HTML because that's what they're in control of. Um, you know, these things are double digit numbers of kilobytes, maybe a little bit more for like jQuery. Um, the images are going to outweigh them by a huge amount, right? This, this thing called NCAA logo.png is 40 kilobytes, not a huge image, but a lot larger than, you know, the JavaScript back there. And this, whatever this is, another, so that was at four, uh, five, 550 kilobytes for that. This is where the, the number, the bytes are really piling up on this page. Um, if you're going to make your page fast and your page has images on it, hey, here's some news. You're going to end up being an image compression expert, at least to a certain extent, um, because that's where the bytes are coming from. So I'm going to, I'll say a few things about this. I'll, I'll pick this up again next week. But um, okay, so first thing, get the right image format. Um, SVG images are about, well, they're vector images. They're things that are made up of like, circles and lines and, and text. Um, so if you have an image where that's that's going to be the case, like maybe this SFU logo, uh, I suspect it's a PNG. It probably could have been a, uh, an SVG image because, yeah, it's like simple shapes and lines. And yeah, we could have done that. Um, JPEG images are about photographs. So this, again, slightly weird composite, but fundamentally photographish. This should be a JPEG, and I suspect if I open it, it is. Uh, yeah, it's a JPEG. Um, and then PNG for any other bitmap image. Um, this is a first uh, step. Um, JPEG has a, a compression quality scale that you can slide. Um, PNG has a color depth, like how many unique colors are available for each pixel, which you, you're in control of. Those should... Um, okay, before I... Here, I, I just want to point out like how this can go wrong. And so this, like, I don't want to pick on the English department. This is not the fault of the Department of English or anybody that works for them. This is a software bug. Eh, not a bug. This is a software imperfection. Um, these images, right? Like, so every faculty member here has this thumbnail image. So, like this, I checked this one. I don't know why some of us ha some of us get to be sitting on a rock and some of us are standing in a photo studio. But anyway, um, this image is this big. It's displayed this big. Um, this image is uh, where is it here? Why, why don't we? unknown how can it be an unknown size anyway it's going to be you know some reasonable number of uh, of kilobytes there and there's dozens of them on this page that page loads slow it's not because of the html or the javascript or the css and it's not because of somebody who works in the department of english it's a fault of the content management system that we have right so cq5 or whatever the hell it's called um should have some sense of how this how those images are going to get displayed and it should scale them before they have to get sent to the user. It doesn't do that, right? So some user has taken the picture of, I've already forgotten his name, that nice uh, prof in the English department, and they've dragged it over from their desktop. That's totally a reasonable thing to do. The content management system, some developer should have written a few lines of code that says, hey, how big are you just going to display that? Okay, well, we'll get it in that range. So, um, there's a bunch of automated tools for this, but I think I'm probably just going to stop here. I'll pick up next week with a demo of these things. I think listing them is boring. Showing showing you how much effect they actually have on real images is much more interesting. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I don't know. There's an exercise due this week. Do it. 
uh, groups need to be formed. Do it. Um, find a group or enter your group into courses. Um, you know that go to the course page and there's a manage groups tab or whatever it is. Um, do that and yeah, we'll pick up from there next week. See you then.